Um, good evening. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Martha Kazungu and um, I'm working here as assistant curator. I'd like to welcome you to the event. It's a performance lecture with Sin Chi Yun and um, followed by a conversation. The event is part of the program of the exhibition Archive of Experiences, part of this year's training of photography. It is funded in the program Marking Nation of the German Federal Culture Foundation. Um, now, just a few lines about um, the artist who is going to give us a performance this, this evening. Sin Chi Yun is an artist from Singapore whose research best practice includes photography, moving image, archival interventions, and text based performances, and focuses on history, conflict, memory, and extraction. She's currently based in New York, where she will be a fellow on the Whitney Museum's independent study program 23 to 20, no, 2022 to 2023. She has done multiple solo exhibitions with her work on the anti-colonial movements in British Malaya, which will next be shown at the Istanbul Biennale opening this month. Cheyin was commissioned as the Nobel Peace Prize photographer in 2017. She is represented by Zuberman Gallery in Berlin and Hanat TZ Gallery in Hong Kong. She's also doing, um, no, that's all. <laughs> um, so feel at home and you're welcome. Thank you very much. Two years ago, I gave birth to a little boy. A day before the peak of COVID-19 deaths in London. A time when they were issuing no birth, but just death certificates. It was traumatic for all of us. But perhaps nothing like what you had experienced in your time. I gave him a part of your name, the Yi that you had used in your pen name when you wrote those anti-colonial editorials and speeches. Resolute, firm, tenacious, determined, Yi Wei. I wonder what else he inherits from our pasts, what he carried with him into the world, what he will take into the future. What of my excavating the stories of you and your compatriots, the stories of struggle, destruction, sacrifice, idealism, conviction, did he get in utero? What of my digging in the colonial archive in those final months of the pregnancy was he exposed to? What transpired through my skin into his? What echoes? Does history write itself in a line or in circles? What do we owe to our forebears? What do we imprint on our children? When the family laughs nervously about how your genes skipped a generation and passed on to me, maybe they weren't joking. There was never a photograph of you in our home or in any of your children's houses. For years, I wondered why they never spoke about you. Why does grandma's gravestone not bear your name? Did they really forget? Could they?
Malaya, the war that was never declared. The British called it the Malayan Emergency so they could keep insurance policies covering the all-important rubber and tin commodity supplies from their prized colony. Local leftist communist guerrilla fighters took to the cities, plantations, and jungles to take on the colonial and commonwealth forces. Fought between 1948 and 1960, this war precedes America's war in Vietnam in important ways. The use of Agent Orange as a defoliant was piloted by the British in Malaya, and the tactics of resettling the population to starve the communist fighters of food, men, and medicine was first trialed in Malaya. Later in Vietnam, this was the infamous strategic Hamlet's policy. Malaya was in fact the longest conflict the British fought overseas after World War II, but it is barely memorialized in either the former metropole or the post-colonial states of Malaysia and Singapore. How then to re-remember, re-articulate this war, restitute the missing pieces in the official and necessarily colonial archive? How can one cast a disobedient gaze over that which is the colonial archive? Or at least shine a light that illuminates the indexicality of the colonial archive, a light that also transforms the colonial prints into new scenes, new access points, new imaginaries. Can we possibly unsee the colonial gaze? Can we remake the materiality of the archive itself? Can we revert them to the glass negatives and daguerreotypes of old? and try to subvert the technology that accompanied the imperial enterprise? What emerges when we recontextualize, jumbo, represent, reformat the visual record that informed the public memory of this war? How can one use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house? Whose bodies do we see? Whose bodies are foregrounded? Which bodies are rarely sighted? What words are used to describe the yellow and brown bodies? Do they elevate, subjugate, or re-perpetuate violences? Whose bodies are missing, captured or uncaptured by the imperial shutter a photograph post-mortem and then destroyed or hidden only to re-emerge on eBay. What happens in conflicts where the camera was rarely in the hands of the so-called losers? How can we allow them to represent themselves? How can we get to the moment before the imperial violence? How do we get to the original sin of colonialism to fight for some sort of restitution or at least resistance? Can we get it from the land where the smell of blood and firearms has long evaporated? Do the jungles, lakes, and elephants inherit traces and become an unspoken archive? Can we re-see this landscape through our eyes and find potentials hist potential histories of the past? Or through counter-archiving the objects that were trophies to the colonial army, but tools of survival to the local anti-colonial fighters? Can we extricate the familial from the colonial? 
Can we reframe the colonial with the personal? Can we get at the intergenerational trauma by performing it, embodied, as post-memory? I never met you. The family from the time I was a child never spoke about you. I pestered dad and his older brother about you. They never wanted to talk, even after 60 years. One Lunar New Year, on my visit home, my mom handed me a black and white photograph. It was of a man with thick lips and a high forehead, standing hands on hip, and a camera was slung around his neck. There had been another photographer in the family. I was intrigued. Eventually, Oda's uncle coughed up a letter from August 1990. It was one of many letters our relatives in China had written to us and sent us over the decades. We never replied to them. Grandma had ordered your five children to forget about you. I called the only phone number in the letter. I introduced myself as your granddaughter. They thought I was a cheat and tested me by asking me to name your five children. I asked to visit and found myself on an improbable journey into your pasts. I got on a bus and rode seven hours north from Hong Kong to modern day Maysian City. These roads did not exist when you were deported by the British from Malaya. I retraced this route by land, stopping at the jetty that great granddad had left China from in the late 1800s, and the same steps you walked up when you returned in early 1949. I met our relatives. I found the house that great granddad had built and where you had lived when you returned, before you took the, to the hills to join the local Chinese Communist guerrilla army in fighting the civil war. I looked for traces of you in this 100-year-old house where our distant relatives still live, farm, and gamble, and sometimes eat boiled rat for breakfast. I was speechless when I saw the three-meter-high monument built to commemorate your martyrdom for the Chinese communists, and your grave tablet at its foot, bearing the names of your four sons. There was no other trace of you here. It had been 62 years, and no one in your immediate family had returned before. I started piecing together the fragments of your life, making sense of why you had become taboo in your own family. A relative ran into a room in the old house and handed me an old photograph. He said it was the only thing you had brought back from Malaya. It was your prison photo. It bears your detainee number and your name romanized into English. I have seen many others since in the archives and from the interviews I've done. It seems the British had every deportee photographed and inoculated against smallpox before putting you all on ships back to China. Your eyes seem to have lost the luster they once had. For another two years, your family did not know you were already dead. I looked in the county archives and found a paragraph recording your role and death. Propaganda cadre, People's Liberation Army, local unit, executed July 1949 by the Kuomintang Army Unit. A few months shy of communist liberation. There are so many what ifs in history. What certain? is that your death was the pivot on which the family's fate turned. 
Grandma angrily said you chose politics over family. She never spoke about you again. I don't know if any of your children knew much about your life, about what shaped your ideas, conviction, your work, and about your possible double life as an underground political activist. There were murmurs of your socialist ideals, the sighting of a pistol, but never a smoking gun. I looked deep in the family photo albums for some clues. There you were, in your high school volleyball team, in the front row, first from left. You seemed to self-consciously tuck your left arm far behind your body in the shadow. We now know the hairy mole on your upper left arm was the vital clue that helped relatives identify your body from amongst the corpses in the mass grave you were left in after being executed. We now know you were a school principal in northern Malaya in the late 1930s and into the 1940s, and then the chief editor of the leftist newspaper Ipo Daily in 1946, and that you penned anti-colonial editorials. One of Dad's primary school classmates remember you making fiery anti-British speeches in their town. Another classmate later teased him about his communist father. There are no official records of your arrest, but there is a deportation list with your name on it. The British had declared a state of emergency across Malaya. You were offered so-called voluntary repatriation in those times of overcrowded jails. Some sort of choice that was. You took it anyway. Oldest uncle recalls that, recalls that you had written a letter to grandma before you were deported. You implored her to, quote, come back to China with me. Didn't you always say you would go wherever I went? You left. They remained. She would go on to lament, we always said we never wanted to be apart, but in the end, we ended up being parted forever. Does it work to externalize this mem these memories as performances, as texts, as objects? Recasting them posthumously, might we somehow find restitution and repair? Or is memory visual at all? Dang 
，到明天。International。Thank you.